Our next speaker is Stephen Lee, um, the author of Blue, um, and um, a fine and recognized composer as well of computer music. We'll hear some of these pieces tonight as well. So um, put your hands together, please, for Stephen Lee. My own personal history with C-Sound and kind of, uh, uh, if, if Dr. B's talk was about C-Sound on day one, I'd probably be talking about C-Sound at day 4,000. So uh, starting from my time uh, learning C-Sound up to today and kind of my views on C-Sound's development as a software developer using C-Sound. So for those who haven't seen it, this is uh, sort of hard to see. It's, uh, Picture of my program, Blue. It's a kind of a music composition environment that's built on C Sound. Um, uh, you can sort of see a score timeline with some closure programming code. Uh, picture of a graphical instrument that you can build with a GUI builder in the program. And uh, sort of a picture of the mixture system with the uh, effects that are all written using uh, C-Sound code, as well as uh, the mm. built-in GUI editor. Okay. Okay, so this was sort of my proposal for this talk, was to uh, sort of look back a little bit about how C-Sound evolved over, the, over time, uh, and how, um, how that impacted me as a user and as a developer. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start with uh, sort of my early uh, experiences with C-Sound, uh, go through talking about uh, my evolution, and uh, starting as a, just a user to becoming a developer using C-Sound and uh, a developer of C-Sound. Uh, and in the end, I'll talk about the uh, sort of where I see C-Sound going and where I see Blue going. Um, Okay, uh, I, be I began using C-Sound, I think my first encounter was in 1998, uh, I was studying in college, uh, probably at the time, it was around the time of C-Sound 3 point, whatever. Uh, I think WinSound was available, I don't remember exactly, um, but I had first come across C-Sound through Cecilia. Uh, that was my kind of uh, point of entry. Uh, I studied just studied it just a little bit on my own, uh, on my own home system, as the university I was studying at was mostly about electronic music, uh, using analog synthesizers and tape, uh, as well as using um, uh, digital MIDI-based studios, whether it's uh, Pro Tools, uh, DX7, DX816, things like that. Uh, right around 2000, the C-Sound book comes out, and this comes to the point where I'm really starting to commit to learning C-Sound and using it. Uh, and that would be the time of CSound 4. Uh, at the same time, this is sort of the early days of commercial software synthesizers. Uh, I found that they were expensive, they were really cool, but I still had questions uh, at that time about the longevity of my own work. This was a real early concern for me, um, especially too with the kind of advent of uh, freeware and shareware programs that were available at the time. I remember doing a project or two and finding that uh, not even a year later I, could, I couldn't really open the projects. Things were dying left and right. And this was a, a, a something that would be a theme for me for many years. Uh, I had moved to New York after I graduated college and uh, was starting to learn how to program. And that was really about the time when I started to study C-Sound. And I found C-Sound attractive because it was free, uh, it was open source. The open source was interesting at the time, but it became much more meaningful later. Uh, it was a language-based system, and as I was also learning programming in general, I found that the, um, the language-based system was attractive. I found that the, the precision of expression was something that was really, uh, something that drew me in. Uh, and also the community was, was very open. I remember uh, joining the mailing list, uh, meeting Michael Goggins through the mailing list. I think uh, John may have uh, answered my first question uh, about C-Sound many years ago. Um, but 
in my initial studies, I, I did one note in this piece, and I found that that was enough for me. So in 2000, I started to work on uh, a program called, uh, originally called uh, Object Composition Environment, uh, later becoming Blue. This was my uh, kind of, uh, I was learning Java at the time, and became my kind of initial program, my, uh, my first Java program. Uh, and it was, uh, I was working as a Flash programmer at the time. And it was, the design of Blue was kind of heavily influenced from working with the Flash development environment. The initial goal in writing Blue was uh, uh, to visually organize and manipulate score in time. I wanted a timeline to, to work with. This was something that I was myself comfortable with from using Pro Tools and using uh, Cakewalk and other sequencers. And also uh, from my uh, kind of studies doing uh, notated music. So uh, I, I wanted a visual environment for the score writing. Now, on the other hand, I found that the code, coding aspect for writing instruments was felt pretty good. It felt natural to me. It was a nice alignment there. But the score writing really felt like it was uh, uh, kind of cognitive dissonance. Uh, and just as a trivia, uh, blue became blue uh, once I changed the theme. And it was uh, sort of inspired by the uh, Palm Pilot, uh, the old PDA that had a, a blue light when you turned it on, uh, the back light on. So early days, for me at least, uh, 2001, 2004. Uh, this is the time of CSound 4. At that point, CSound 4 is, I would say, in those years, it was relatively stable. There was still a lot of new opcodes being built, but the, the language itself was, hadn't changed too much. Um, and at this time, I'm beginning my development of Blue. Uh, the, the process of uh, how it operated was that it would generate a CSD file uh, and then execute CSound upon that CSD. There wasn't too much communication between the two programs. And that was really what was available at the time. Uh, um, the design of Blue was meant to work generically with no data. And to work generically meant that uh, I could only assume very little about what was being written. And that meant that I could only make certain kinds of tools. Because if I was to make more assumptions uh, built into the tools, then that would limit the kind of C sound instruments or uh, score that could be written. Um, and at this point in time, I'm thinking about CSound in a way of what does it offer and what can I build as a, as a software maker uh, on top of it? Uh, what abstractions does CSound have and what can I do with it? Um, also, in 2002, it was actually a, a really important time for me. Uh, I spent the fall in Krakow, Poland, and uh, I developed this uh, very small Python library called the uh, Crestal Composition Library still include, included with Blue today. Um, and why this was important was that I found that uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, I, scripting became very important to me as a composer uh, as a part of my compositional practice. It's a way to kind of develop and express musical ideas. And two, that it was embedded in Blue, the, the Python interpreter, um, meant that my projects are absolutely portable. I can move my project between uh, at the time, Windows and Linux, and later on, uh, when OS X comes out uh, and becomes popular, I can move it to OS X, and my projects worked on any of these platforms. So uh, by embedding all of these dependencies directly into my program, I found that, and, and having control over that, meant that uh, those early concerns of mine about software uh, and my own projects, the longevity of those, were being addressed. Uh, 2004, 2005, I think, is a really important period in CSound. Um, at the very end of CSound 4, uh, we have some really big language changes. Uh, Matt Ingalls uh, develops a concept of sub-instruments, sub uh, which was later uh, modified by Istvan Marba to become user-defined opcodes. Uh, Matt Ingalls also introduced the if-then syntax. And uh, to me, this was the first time, um, at least within the history of when I was using CSound, that the language itself changes, uh, and the kind of capacity of things, how we express our, ourselves musically with C-Sound changes. It gives us new options. Uh, for me, as a software developer, it also gave me new things to build upon. 
uh, CSOM 5 uh, directly re addresses the kind of concerns of software makers with um, the introduction of reentrancy and the building of an API, making CSOM into a library, and also having new language bindings, allowing uh, people like me working in Java to uh, embed CSOM within this program. Within Blue, I was uh, also you know, working to further develop new features built upon the abstractions I had already built, uh, sound objects, new processors, and things. Uh, again, in Krakow, in, in summer of 2005, is also kind of a big point for me for Blue. I started working on the, the mixer system that I showed earlier. And the mixer system would, would lead to the graphical instrument system as well as the graphical effects uh, and automation of parameters. All of these would then tie in once I integrate the API into Blue. Um, this really is the, at least the personal moment for me where I start to think of CSound not as just a separate program, but as a library that I'm building upon. Uh, and this is also when Blue starts to have real-time capabilities. These are things that are afforded to me now that the, the API is available. Two thousand five to two thousand eleven. I would say this was a very interesting period of time, uh, a time when T seven five becomes. Uh, it's a period where T seven five matures and becomes more refined. A lot of bugs are being addressed. Uh, changes are being done. A lot of the changes are, are being done under the hood, though. Right. A lot. A lot of things happening, uh, not directly to the user, but internally, things are changing. Uh, in the, in the fall of two thousand six, uh, I had some time off. Uh, I was living in Warsaw. And I remember spending a, a full month working on the new parser. This was, uh, I had received code from John, and I was really interested to really get into the code of CSOUND. And I remember spending like long time every day for, for about a month trying to learn compilers, which was an uh, interesting way to go about it, I guess. Um, that new parser would be later integrated into CSOUND 5. Uh, and it's a kind of representation of internal work that users don't see until much later. Uh, for Blue, it's also a, a period of time of refinement and maturity, uh, but it's also a period of internal work. In 2009, I moved from using just Swing code to this platform called the NetBeans platform. This, uh, this change took roughly nine or 10 months to do, and it's a period of refactoring where uh, I'm changing all of my legacy code and it gives practically no benefit to the user immediately, but it does set up the, the internal structures for later development. Two thousand eleven. Two thousand eleven is a very interesting time. Uh, this is when I also start my PhD here at Minuth uh, with Victor. Uh, and after the first CSound conference, uh, there was an interest in CSound on iOS and Android. Uh, I had had experience working as a, a mobile software developer from 2007 to, to 2011. And so working with uh, John, Victor, Dr. B, and others, uh, we get CSound uh, compiled and running on iOS and Android. Uh, later in 2013-ish, with Victor and Ed Costello, we get CSound working on the web directly through uh, Inscription or uh, using the Pinnacle uh, uh, system. We also see that CSound starts to move on to affordable embedded systems, Raspberry Pi and Arduino. And this is a very interesting period of time because we see CSound uh, moving out from the traditional desktop systems that we're using, uh, from, from servers and, and desktops to portable systems that are in people's pockets and uh, in their bags. And it's a kind of way that we, we take our, for those of us who have put no, known CSAM, uh, take our experience and our knowledge and, and to reuse it elsewhere. Um, so, uh, moving forward to 2012, when we start working on CSAM 6. A very interesting time. Uh, CSound 6 has a kind of, uh, I think from CSound 5 to CSound 6, we start to see this kind of acceleration of change internally. 
Uh, and we, we see there's a kind of balance between things that are happening underneath the hood that sets up work for later <coughs> that users will eventually see directly as they code in CSAM. So 2012, externally, what do we see? We get with CSAM 6 transactional compilation or live coding. Uh, this is interesting to me um, as a user. Um, I actually use the live coding features of CSAM uh, as I develop a lot of uh, the filter code that I've been working on lately. Um, uh, it allows me to just quickly edit a line of code and just recompile. Um, it, uh, it interests me greatly as a software developer, uh, writing Blue. Uh, gives me new options on what kinds of software I can build. Uh, we have arrays and sample, sample accurate processing. processing. And uh, probably a number of other features that I've uh, missed, but these are all things that are externally available to the user, right? that's being exposed to the language. Internally, uh, there is work on the uh, new type system and runtime type identification. These are kinds of things that if you're a programmer or if you do language design, these are probably well-known things. Uh, but for, for the CSAM community, if you're not doing so much of this kind of stuff, um, type system is what will allow, it allows us to define in a concrete way the data types that we have. So all of the uh, I, K, A, the S string values, the uh, F signals, all become concrete things as opposed to bits of code everywhere. Uh, having that type system is, uh, allows us to isolate co code into specific places. And the runtime and type identification system allows us to reuse that type system to figure out the kinds of variables that are being done at runtime. This stuff is really kind of heady stuff. It's really internal at this point, right? But, uh, and, and I, I say here, the type system for developers. This is really uh, kind of internal work that's only gonna benefit, in, in the period of CSAM 6, uh, people who are developing new kinds of signals uh, and signal processing code uh, in, in C and not in CSAM code directly. C sound six was great, and in a way, I'm still catching up with that on the blue side. But C sound six took a lot of time, um, and but still, things developed in blue. Uh, here, uh, the, the few big things that happened over this period of time is uh, kind of commitment to modular development. It's a kind of style of practice of uh, software software design. Um, and that yields out the, the layer groups as plugins. Uh, in, in blue, from the first photo I showed briefly, um, you would see that there's different layers on the timeline. But these layers are actually plugins. Like anyone as a third party could develop their own plugin that would create their own layer on the same timeline as all the other layers that I have. Um, and there were two types of layers that were developed. Uh, pattern layers for kind of writing pattern-based music. Uh, as well as audio layers. The audio layer system came out recently and um, builds upon all the things that are in CSAM and actually implements pretty much the exact same signal processing code that's used in Ardor uh, for its fade system um, and allows you to do kind of digital audio, you know, cutting, splicing, fade work um, directly within Blue in the midst of all the other code and um, uh, score writing. Uh, abilities that Blue has. And that moves Blue from having this kind of uh, singular timeline with the boxes on the timeline to uh, a timeline that could have different kinds of interfaces. Uh, also recently, the, the sound sound object uh, in Blue has advanced. The sound sound object is one that allows you to write C sound orchestra code as a one-off instrument. The sound sound object now has the same GUI editor as the instrument editor. And this allows you to create kind of uh, visual little mini machines of sound processing, very much like uh, Kima's sound object system. Uh, this is now uh, sort of where I'm at now with Blue. But again, I was saying that I'm, I'm still catching up with C Sound 6 in a way. A lot of the features with um, uh, the live coding and all of these things are things that I have not yet had a chance to really implement within Blue itself and that I'm interested to take advantage of. 
Uh, also, this is another period of time for me where I'm also doing kind of a, uh, a lot of core internal work um, that is, uh, in this case, moving towards a new GUI toolkit that um, users won't see immediately the benefits of, but will soon, soon enough. Moving forward, we have CSound 7. Now, the kinds of things that we saw in CSound 6, that type system, now start to become uh, exposed to the end user, right? So we have uh, a new parser that, that I put together, builds upon the, old, the, the new parser, uh, so now it's just parser three. Um, there are kind of three new features that have uh, been mostly implemented already. Uh, User-defined types, which allows users in their C sound code to create their own data types. Uh, why would you do this? You would probably want to use it for, if you were going to create your own event generation system, you may want to define your own types. If you're doing new kinds of signal processing research and you need a data type, you can do it directly within the CSound uh, user code. Uh, to go along with that, to, to make that work for the user, uh, two other features need to be added, which was the explicit types and text for variables, uh, which allows us to say, this is a variable colon of this type, uh, and also uh, new style UDOs, which is, again, um, related to the user defined types and the explicit types and text. Uh, these kinds of things, I think, open up possibilities for what kinds of research, what kind of, uh, kind of ways we can use CSound uh, as users. Uh, the next four things are things that are kind of planned, uh, and they're somewhat designed. Uh, they just need to be implemented. Uh, first is the, the API has the further exposure of the data types. This allows uh, third-party programs like Blue or any other to use the channel system with these new, um, new data types that users may define or that developers may define. Uh, the UGen API is a developer API to use opcodes on their own. So with CSound, uh, up until today, 30 years, uh, uh, you would write your code, opcodes are assembled together but within the boundary of an instrument instance. With the UGen API, developers can uh, instantiate each opcode on their, on their own and connect them as they wish, much like in PD. Uh, and this is a, a kind of thing that I, I had done a research project a couple years ago. Uh, so there is kind of um, already existing code that, that, that works. It's a matter of porting it over to uh, the CSound 7 code base. Uh, opcodes as values is a sort of a complex thing to discuss, um, but it relates to the UGen API about the ability to instantiate uh, opcodes on their own, pass them around, and uh, allows us to, uh, as users, control the ordering of processing. We could then say, you know, uh, run this opcode first, which may be uh, a delay, run this opcode next, which may be a revert and then later on programmatically switch to say which way we want, which one we want to order, uh, run first. And finally is a node system, which is uh, a user feature, uh, one that we would use in user code as a way to uh, instantiate instruments, but then uh, insert them within a graph of processing that we would have control over, much like SuperCollider's uh, way of um, <coughs> having synth instances that you could then order in, into uh, uh, different nodes. From my perspective on Blue, uh, I'm moving in a, in a kind of interesting way, uh, building upon you know C sound uh, features in six and seven. Um, I'm adding more and more high level tools to Blue, so that the entry point coming into into Blue is more of a, of a graphical system that. Um, users wouldn't have to know C sound to start, but could use to develop their own instruments and effects, uh, sounds, and other things. Um, I've talked about Blue 3.0 for a few years now, and it's a kind of uh, a point where I need to uh, integrate the work from, from C sound 6 uh, and make uh, 
move fully real time, uh, such that uh, any changes to objects could be reflected immediately while in the middle of addition auditioning. Uh, and again, I'll have to update these features again for T Sound 7. So, uh, reflecting upon all this, uh, I would say that the, even though it's been 30 years, like the core of C Sound has changed a lot in the last five years. Um, and again, this idea that sometimes we we maybe hear about changes that are happening internally, we we might not understand why it's being done, why uh, all this work is happening towards uh, something that doesn't immediately change anything for users. It sets up work for much later. All the work from CSound 6 ends up being what supports the abilities to be expressed and then accessible to users in CSound 7. Um, as a whole, as a, one of the most exciting things for me, uh, again, is, is this living history of CSound. It's an amazing thing that you know a work from 1979 uh, operates today in the same exact software environment that is 2016. Uh, I think that can't be uh, uh, emphasized enough that these works are not just some kind of historical other, but it, it's something that we can actually experience and use today and something that we can reuse and, uh, and learn from. Uh, the portability of CSAM, I think, is uh, something, as a, as a user, is, excites me most. Uh, that I could use my knowledge of CSound on all, on all these other platforms, um, I think is a, is a kind of a real value add for uh, my own CSound work. Uh, in terms of extensibility, as a user and as a developer, I find that CSound offers a great deal, but it, al it also allows me to add new things that I want to add uh, that may uh, not may not be available as yet. Uh, for example, the it was really exciting for me in the past few months to translate some filters from uh, C and C++ code that I'd seen online and write user-defined opcodes that could do sample process sample by sample processing. Uh, and without having to, to modify C sound or write C code, just writing standard uh, C sound orchestra code. Uh, I could add my, these filters uh, to my practice. Um, as an application developer, I find it exciting that I can use CSound as the core of my program and borrow from a great deal of other people's work uh, who are working in other, other kind of areas of CSound use. Um, I think with CSound, again, going back to this whole thing about history, I think we have to respect history, but we also have to respect the changing world too, and I think that's something that we've done very well. Uh, keeping the, the past works alive is, is uh, uh, I think, uh, tremendously valuable for a kind of shared culture and history. Um, but I think that um, making sure that we're up to date and being able to do the things that our um, new research uh, kind of develops and being able to bring that into CSound is a, a true value. Uh, finally, it's, uh, I found it to be very rewarding to be in this community um, and to use the software. Uh, it's been wonderful to see the program evolve over time uh, and to see and hear all the wonderful works that people have created with it. So that's it. That's my, my bit of uh, reflection on the history of CSound from my point of view. Steven, does anyone have any questions? Richard? Steven, you use your, your fantastic new user-defined library, which seems inspired by Eurorack modular synthesizers in some There's ways. That, yeah. Are we going to see a, a whole blob of blue that has modules like this? Uh, uh, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day, and I keep searching for, for more, but... They yeah. sound phenomenal, by the yeah. way. They're, they're, they're a dream. I, I, I'm having a great time with them, actually. I, uh, you know, I, as much as I, I like enjoy coding in C and Java, I actually really enjoy coding in C sound code and making music. Um, I would love to have more uh, real-time 
kind of uh, modular kind of uh, music practice within Blue. I think that would be fantastic. I, it's a matter of uh, there's certain things I have to do to get there. Yeah. It, it'll take a little time, but hopefully, yeah. It just yeah. seems like they're waiting for you, so not urge, not to push, because Blue's got so much great stuff in it, but boy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, the uh, filters you've been doing last week's uh, based on uh, um, the modular filters, uh, would you say there's a difference in performance writing this as an opcode in C sound rather than in C? Is there like oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I would say it's, it's definitely, it has to, it, you know, writing in C would be the fastest. But writing in, in C sound code is actually not that bad. Uh, Surprisingly, actually, um, I was using one of the filters the other day that I wrote, um, and I looked at the CPU and it was like two percent. It was almost negligible. It would become a factor if I was to say have thirty-two note polyphony, but I'm not going to use thirty-two notes of polyphony for this. Um, I think the question I think about is: Is it fast enough? And I think more than more more than enough. Yeah, for for my use cases. Uh, it's also extremely portable. I don't have to recompile C sound for this. I can just do it as, as a user. I can just put it in. And these kinds of things are the kinds of things that I find um, very attractive for what kind of system I evaluate and use. So uh, it sort of ticks off all the boxes of what, of what I'm looking for. Yeah. In some ways, I've always felt it's been so nice to have like a UDO version or a C sound instrument version and then the code. I found it so helpful when you know, we had Sean Costello mm -hmm. Reverb as a C sound instrument, and then we had the or Resi filter from Michelson as a C sound instrument, then as a so I mean I hope your filters ultimately become C sound filters, but I love I think always having both from the teaching standpoint is really cool and important. I I, I do find myself I'm thinking the same. It, it's it is valuable to be able to see and not have to change languages and move right. to something else. Uh, I just, just having one system and seeing all this being expressed is, uh, I don't want, like, I, I get tired sometimes lately, like going from Java to C to Clojure to C sound and going back and forth to all these different languages. And it's nice to just be able to work in one. Yeah. And what, in my case, where the students don't know enough C yet, yeah. but C sound, looking at your filters and seeing that it's this complicated equation, Mm. It helps them see at another level. Yeah. So I always find that, whereas if you showed it to them in C code, the C yeah. would lose them. <laughs> so yours helps them get to that next place. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So I'm just going to say, as a matter of principle, mm -hmm. if, if this filter starts being not fast enough for use, we just recode it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, that's almost a commitment. Yeah. yeah. As long as I'm around, I'm, I'm happy to recode things, but not. Which we try to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was talking with Victor about it just, just uh, at lunch today. He was saying the same thing. Like, oh, we should put it in C. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, but, uh, these filters are yeah. They sound great. Just I mean, yeah. I think it's very good. By the way, this is only four hours in a day. So all of those hours are spent doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I would say though, this is not filter code that I wrote. It's filter code I translated. It was originally by Will Perkle. So. Uh, yeah. To give credit where I could do, but uh, the, the ability to that to be able to translate it into T C sound code was really uh, to be at this point it was, it was really uh, a treat. Yeah. And just have, uh, one fun question: when you were talking about the node system, um, have you guys discussed how what kind of interface this is going to take in terms of user? Is it going to be something I don't know similar to maybe how Michael Goggins implemented his? A uh, signal graph or connect, up, or is it going no, to be something different? A, this is very interesting, right? So Michael Goggins introdu introduced the, uh, the the signal graph thing, um, and I've always found it a little tricky because when I want to create effects, I may want to create multiple instances of yeah. effects. So what Michael's code does, uh, it does solve a problem, but it, it does it at the level of the the definition, not the instanti instance itself. Mm -hmm. um, the node system would uh, would give you the same, uh, th pretty much the very same system as what's in Super Collider, uh, and having um, you 
say when when it gets processed and all of your opcodes will determine how signals are written to a bus or not or okay, but in terms of the user code like how is this going to be this is all orchestra code it's not score score code it's no it's orchestra code. orchestra code yeah and it would it be, be like, like something in instrument zero or something add. okay right yeah it would be um i think I, I i emailed about it on the developer list um uh, you would create a node, and then you would create an instance of an instrument. You would add it to the node, and then okay. you could you, you can, can reorder it. You can go can. like an instance of instrument one, instrument three, instrument one, instrument three. You can do whatever you want okay. once you have the instances, because you're, you're working on instances and not definitions. Okay, yeah. great. And just in terms of the UGen API, um, that would give um, front end developers or even like back end developers or people using C and C sharp to call opcodes as they would, like say for example. Um, as classes in C++ yeah. and this kind of thing. Yeah, so you could do something like uh, in C sharp code, let's say, you know, uh, um, also k equals new also, new also. Yeah, yeah. and then also dot process or something like that. Okay. The, the, you may need to do, there's an extra layer maybe that has to be done. But as, have you started working on this already? Is this I, had done, I had done a paper with uh, Roger Dannenberg um, some three, three or four years ago. Uh, I wrapped every, uh, all the CSUN opcodes uh, for use with his system Aura, yeah. right? So, and that worked. I could I could actually one by one instantiate an oscillator, a filter. I could mix it in between with Aura, well, the equivalent of Aura opcodes. Um, and is, is, is all the, are all the opcodes stuff, is that running, is that being called from the host language or is that an, mm -hmm. it's still a library? In, is it, are you still calling some kind of underlying CSUN library or is everything oh, no. now? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's basically like it's like a wrapper around the C sound opcode okay. that gets made, and when I call it, it's calling C sounds process function and init function. And all that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great. Look forward to seeing seeing all of this wonderful yeah. stuff. Great. Thanks again, Steve. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just one last question. Uh, what was the transition like between you as a as a user of C sound to being a developer? The integration, uh, you have two fundamentally different languages to integrate, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as Blue as a software, which is in essence written in Java, and you're housing C sound, which is written in C. So, uh, how difficult or easy was the integration? What was the learning curve? There? It's hard for me to say at the time because I was there as it came out and as things changed, and I would say it's easier now than it was probably when I started because th th things have been refined. Um, for me, I've worked in a number of languages, so I feel comfortable switching. Sometimes it gets tiring, but it, I feel okay with it. And when I do, I have to compartmentalize very well and uh, assign like, what am I going to be doing in CSAM? What am I going to be doing in Java? Uh, the, the interface between the two that is provided with CSAM releases is it's it's Java. So when I go to interface with the API, I have a, a Java class that I just instantiate and run. That part is actually really well done, I think. It's really simple. Uh, and then it's a matter of learning the API, learning channels, learning the, the, the API functions for evaluating code, uh, score code or orchestra code. Um, and from there, it's a matter of figuring out, well, what part am I going to show the user? Am I going to show them C sound code that they can edit, or am I going to have just a GUI? that they're going to be able to manipulate, but it's going to do kind of C sound changes in the background. I think uh, if one was to teach C sound, and it, it would probably be ideal to first have a kind of, some kind of firm grounding in the basics of C sound knowledge, uh, learn how the channel system works, even just by using it with C sound Qt or with Blue. And then from there, think of it as replacing CSound Qt or Blue with your own application code. Once you get there, it becomes quite clear then, I think, how you're going to communicate between the two and, and, how, and the, what part you would put in what, in what side. Okay. Thanks again, Steven. Yep. Yeah.